بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین وسلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ویلکم آڈینس ٹو ٹوک ان دین پوڈ کاسٹ آئی ایم یو ہوسٹ ماجد اینڈ آئی ایم اکو ہوس ود می برادر جے کے اینڈ برادر شاز السلام علیکم برادرز وعلیکم السلام ہاؤ یو گائز ڈوئنگ الحمد للہ سبحان اللہ سبحان اللہ از بین ا ایونٹ فل لاسٹ فیو ڈیز وٹ یو گائز میک اف دی الیکشن ریزلٹس Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's what I, I predicted. I didn't think it was going to be any different. Uh, probably the margin of victory was uh, yeah. was a lot bigger. Uh, but it should uh, open a few eyes for people to realize that uh, the real power breakers are the capitalists in the world. Yeah. And uh, it's not really, you can do a lot to change that. Yeah, and it definitely shows where, you know, the thought process of a lot of the population in the UK, where it's going. You know, mm. the Conservative Party are very, you can say on one extreme, actually not not mm. fully far right but they're going towards that direction so the fact that they got such a majority is uh, does tell you a lot about british society today mm. yeah i mean you know in one way if you think about it, it it seems like the majority overlooked the nhs yeah. austerity and all these all these measures and mm. matters and and for them what was most important at the, you know at the same similar to when the brexit, brexit uh, referendum happened mm. was the issue to do with the uh, immigration yeah. and in all honesty to do with islam and muslims as well so definitely anyway we'll see how it goes yeah. you know uh, we uh, you know we, we did do a podcast and we're not going to go into the issue of halal and haram mm. but one quick message i would say to you know to uh, fellow muslims out there is that what we saw over the last few weeks was muslims becoming activated politically yeah uh, you know getting involved and and what i would say is that alhamdulillah this thing in itself is good okay but the what they were getting involved in yeah. and what they were you know uh, activists for mm-hmm. what their objectives were you know this this needs to be uh, corrected to one which is islam and another thing which i want to just mention and, and give credit to the umma actually even those people that to a certain degree you might say that they they said voting is allowed and stuff like that is that every single muslim that i came across even if they try to justify voting they all did it from an islamic point of view mm-hmm. yeah no one turned around and said listen you know what you know islam ain't going to be able to deal with our issues yeah. we're here now we've got all these problems you know forget that you know i think at this moment in time democracy is the best thing mm-hmm. since sliced bread nobody said that yeah. so people try to justify it and uh, alhamdulillah it was good yeah. uh, but okay so inshallah let's get on to the today's topic <clears throat> the today's topic uh, is something which I was speaking to a brother actually and he recommended this topic and he said you know what he said why don't you do a podcast on who are the real terrorists okay and I thought subhanallah you know what this might you know it's 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 worth doing but then also we had the issue of the London Bridge attacks a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. with uh, you know uh, allegedly Usman Khan yeah and what we see from these type of attacks is that um, if the profile fits a certain type of person i.e. a muslim then it always is a terrorist attack um and it's linked to international terrorism international jihad okay and it may well be that you know someone else or maybe you just say a white collar commits the same sort of attack but it's not even you know terrorism isn't even brought into it mm. okay so i thought what's worth doing is let's have a discussion about this because every time this <coughs> attack happens and i'll be honest with you when the news about the the uh, london attacks happened like when they came in mm-hmm. the first thing i thought you know is i thought you know what i hope this is some gang attack mm. some gang violence mm. because i knew and i wasn't surprised if it was because the elections were coming up and i personally Convenient predicted timing. <laughs> predicted something like this but yeah. nevertheless you know i was thinking you know what i i hope it's not some guy who they're going to blame me on islam they're going to uh bring jihad into this you know because what this does is this puts muslims into a corner this puts muslims yeah. onto the defensive okay and you know you hear things like you know uh, uh, people saying you know not all muslims are terrorists you say yeah and but then they'll say well but all terrorists are muslims <laughs> so what you see in here is that islam is being uh, accused of being violent being backward being linked to uh, you know uh, terror and bloodshed okay and what's happening is that the way the people are being conditioned through the media is the fact that now if something happens or if they hear the word jihad 
the first thing that comes into their mind is terrorism. Yeah. Okay? When they think of, you know, even if they think of Khilafah or they think of Sharia, first thing they think is of is uh, people executing people and, and so on and so forth. Okay? Yeah. So that's what I was thinking that this topic itself, inshallah, what we'll do is we'll address this. We'll address who are the real terrorists. Okay? And we'll back this up with facts. Mm. But also, I think it's worthwhile that we need to refine our understanding on certain concepts, especially the concept of jihad. Mm. Because this is something which, you know, some people, some scholars in the past argue that this was the sixth pillar of Islam. And I believe that today, Muslims don't have a correct understanding of it. And because of that, for, for, uh, for no good reason, do we feel like, you know, we're on the defensive? Do mm. we feel like we're guilty mm. uh, without even being proven guilty? And that's why, inshallah, ta'ala, that's my aim for this podcast, inshallah. So I'll start off with the first question, right? So, what is the understanding of terrorism? What is what is the definition of terrorism? What is terrorism? Yeah. It's a good question. I think it is a really good topic, and like you like you explained, is a there's a lot of uh, you know misinterpretation and misunderstanding of what this term actually means. But um, terrorism itself is uh, we, everyone has their own definition of what that what it is, <coughs> but actually it has become very prominent uh, nowadays since 9-11 really and I looked um, into the Oxford Dictionary definition of, of what this term means right so they did the Oxford Dictionary British and World English defines terrorism as, terrorism as the unofficial or unauth- unauthorized use of violence and intimidation in the pursuit of political aims so there's two two interesting points I note, note from this definition and the first thing is that why is it that this terrorism or this violence is only termed terrorism when it's unofficial or uh, unauthorized. And the interesting point here is that, does that mean when violence is authorized or violence is official, i.e. government-led, state-led, then it is okay and it isn't terrorism? So that's the first thing to note, right? And the second point is that, why is it only terrorism when it is in the pursuit of a political aim? Why is it only when it's political violence it's termed terrorism? And again, the interesting thing to note here is that, does that mean, you know, it really highlights that the governments aren't really interested in an attack that may cause terror, but if there's nothing political, they're not that interested. It's not really a threat. But when it becomes political, because it starts affecting the status quo, it starts affecting the Western political interests, then it's termed terrorism because this is more of a threat. So this is the definition used. Many will have different definitions. And actually, in my simple eyes, anything which causes terror would be terrorism for me. But actually, they have a specific definition Mm -hmm. and they want to stick to this. And that's why they don't automatically term something that's, like like you said, a, a white person or a non-Muslim person doing an attack, they won't straight away call it terrorism because actually it's only when it's a certain type of terror or violence that it's termed terrorism. I mean, the word itself it has Latin origins, uh, terere, which means to frighten okay. Um, okay, and scare. So that's the origins of the word or the etymology of the word, if you want to, to see it from that point of view. Mm. I agree with what you're saying. There are certain points that I, I do uh, disagree with. Uh, one of them is that uh, there are very different versions of the word for terrorism. And there's a deliberate reason for that. And one of the reasons is, is that if you actually look at that definition and you look at other definitions that they do come up with, and the UN did come up with one in 2004 yeah. as well, is that it actually implicates uh, governments and states to be terrorists. Uh, at that level as well and it doesn't just keep it at a political level so where do you draw the line and it's good that how uh, it's evolved over time and one of the things when I was looking into this is how has this word evolved and where did it actually be injected into a more political framework Mm. Uh, and what I found is actually in the 1920s the word was really synonymous with gangsters so during the prohibition era in uh, in America, uh, the the terror and terrorists were the people who were bootlegging and were were, were the gangsters. So that was Al Capone, it was, yeah. yeah, Al Capone. So yeah. people like, people like that, you, you know about Al Capone, right? <laughs> so so more more on that on that front. Yeah. And then there was actually a massive spike when during the nineteen seventies. And the, the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, problems that were going on, especially within uh, the British institutions, were against the IRA. 
So the word started becoming a lot more synonymous with the IRA, linking it to fringe groups like that. The the press started using that a lot more uh, into that area. Before this, before the seventies, it wasn't really linked to to that that uh, kind of political atmosphere. It was more to do with a, that thug street level kind of environment. These were the terrorists, and these were the people. Mm-hmm. So uh, and then and then from past the seventies era, from like you said, from nine eleven onwards. It started to be linked with only Muslims, Muslims yeah. uh, and they were the they were the ones. Even when you look at uh, groups uh, uh, like Spain in ETA, you know that's a that, that their agenda is obviously one of that is political. Yeah. Uh, but only recently will they be forced to call them terrorists, or they've yeah. got a terrorist wing. They'll call them a far right extreme group, yeah. but they won't exactly come out with the label and say they're a terrorist organization or they're a terrorist group. Then maybe yeah. they have started to slightly change that on, on that that's because. Right, yeah. People are aware. Look, if you're if you're constantly linking it to Muslims and not this, you're using this definition. So why does this group not fit into it? As well? And and I think that's quite deliberate, actually. Like someone might argue that actually it's not always used for Muslims and Islam because with far right, the rise of far right terrorism uh, or far right attacks, uh, it's been used. Like Finsbury Park, for example, they call that the Fins- Finsbury Attack terror attack, right? Mm. But it wasn't Muslims. It was a far right group or far right person. Um, and yeah, fair point. It's not always used for Muslims nowadays, but actually, that's quite recent. And I believe quite strongly that only because they they saw this backlash, and even non-Muslims recognizing that how comes terrorism is only used when it's a Muslim, and and, and the double standards in this place. Mm. So so I think actually when they saw this happening, they started to use this term when it came to far right terrorism, and and actually you know far right terrorism has increased more recently. So I think, I think it's quite deliberate. Also, as well is, um, like you said there, that they uh, call this Finsbury Park Mosque attack uh, terrorism, right? Mm. And somehow we felt as Muslims that we've achieved something. Yeah, yeah. The reality is, is look, you know, whether this was a terrorist attack or not, but if we are, if we're going to acknowledge that this was a terrorist attack, then are we happy to say, well, okay, you can you can link Islam to terrorism, you can call us terrorists exactly. as long as you call these people terrorists as well. So yeah. that's not the point. So my next question is, is that you know, why is Islam being linked to terrorism? Because especially what you said there, Shaz, about the way you know, the word is being used over the over time, right? Mm-hmm. Why, right now, you'd, you'd probably accept and agree that you know terrorism and all and terror is you know are, are unanimously at the moment linked to Islam and Muslims, right? Yeah. Why is this the case? So, in my, in my view, I think it's deliberate. Um, so, as you were saying, even before nine eleven. There was the term terrorism was used, and you know the IRA mm. problems and the problems. Even the French Revolution, they used this term, to, and it came from that Latin yeah. meaning. Um, but actually, the, the way to really understand it in the in the space of why it's linked to Islam and Muslims is since nine eleven, since the war on terror, right? So uh, George Bush, after nine eleven, um, a few days afterwards, he he termed this statement that we are at a, uh, there's a war on terrorism and a war on terror. Um, and then this became like their slogan for yeah. the invasion of Iraq, the invasion of uh, Afghanistan, for mm. example. And he did get a bit of backlash, but actually this this just caught on. And now um, this war on terror became a massive you know, term. And we've heard it since uh, the, two th- the 2000s, for example. Um, and it's very interesting because th- when you now have a war against a concept, right, um, you, you, it's quite vague. So you can start inserting certain um, you know definitions of what terror is into this and you know we know that it's in fact a war on islam right mm-hmm. and not any islam you know it's not any islam and they can't say war on islam because actually a lot of their population is muslim right so they in the, in the same sense they could have said war on communism when it was a straight clear attacker and a clear aggressor a clear enemy they couldn't say war on islam because this was, would have caused uproar, right? But they termed it war on terror, right? And George Bush himself, um, he quoted, is quoted as saying, uh, our enemy is a radical network of terrorists and every government that supports them when he said this uh, term of war on terror. Yeah. And the reason for that is because now they want to define what is terror, what is terrorism, and that, that's where political Islam comes into play. You know, if you use those, those, those both of those uh, uh, in context, if you call it war on terror... And call it war on Islam. Don't look at the terms. Look at the actions, what they carry out. Yeah. When they carry out those actions, it's exactly the same. Whether they were having a war on Islam or a war on terror, they would be doing exactly the same actions to try and destroy the Islamic ideology. 
Yeah. Now, it's interesting, because like I said, I've never heard if, uh, in the term in history from the French Revolution, yes, they used that term, but they never used it when they were having their war against communism. Yeah. Uh, that's never been used as a term. Or, because at the day, it was, they were fighting on an ideological level. Yeah. And because there was a state apparatus in order to fight them on that level, they couldn't turn around and call it that. Yet, obviously, they will be able to uh, indoctrinate people to realize that, look, it is uh, an ideological battle. They were they were happily openly saying that it's an ideological battle, and the reason why they don't want this uh, uh, the Islamic State to rise and uh, have that kind of battle because then it becomes quite clear and obvious for the Muslims to choose. As George Bush also clearly said, you're either with us or you're against us. So obviously you either side with Islam or you side with the Kufr at the day. Yeah. So I think th- this was an interesting time period where having those words war on Islam, mm. war on terror, yeah. it was deliberately injected at that time because there was there was a massive rise of, of Muslims understanding about Islam and that increasing as well. That yeah, is that does that doesn't make sense because like you said, war on terror it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Or war on terrorism doesn't mean anything because <laughs> you know the the communists, okay, just say uh, when they had the Cold War, they could have called that war on terror. But it was never For never example, referenced. when they have uh, when they had their war on drugs against the the, the cartels, the South American cartels, yeah. Yeah. you know those guys are ruthless. Yeah. That's proper terror. Yeah. You know what I mean? Terrorism, right? They could have called it, they could have called it war on terror. They yeah. never. But here, because like you're saying, mm. they couldn't openly say. This is war in Islam. Yeah. Later on, you'd have to agree though, they did shift a little by bringing in the new concept of Islamism. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But they still have, I don't think they've said war on Islamism, have yeah, they? What you've done is, Maj, you've created the groundwork. Mm. You've created the groundwork for the psyche of the human being or yeah. whoever it is, whether it's the West, even within the Muslim, you've created the psyche to say, right, this is our brand of what terrorism is. Now we're going to try and link it to say, yeah. it's anyone who has any kind of Islamic sentiment. Anyone who thinks that they want Islam, anyone who wants to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying, I want to live my life according to Islam. Yeah. And then it puts the Muslim on the back foot. Mm. That's it a really good point because I, I, I genuinely think that it, terrorism and terror has become so synonymous with Islam that you don't even need to say it. So if you say, oh, there's a terrorist attack or <laughs> war on terrorism or war on terror, straight away, yeah. even the Muslim, straight yeah. away you will think, oh, Islam, Muslims, right? You won't even think twice about who it is and who the target is. You, you know, and they've made it so synonymous that it's really affected our mindset. That's and true, you know, because one, one quick thing is yeah. that, you know, where I can guarantee you, just say an attack's happened somewhere in London or somewhere, right? Go You've got someone on the other side of the country, a Muslim person, right? They will feel uh, anxious. They will feel something like, like if they go into a room full of, just say English people and they and it's on the news, right? And they got you know a picture of Usman Khan up or whatever. Yeah. For some reason, even though they have nothing to do with it, yeah. just because they're Muslims, just because they're probably even their the face is the same colour yeah. to a certain degree, right? They will feel some sort of unease. Unease. Why is that? It's exactly. because of that like you're saying it's become so synonymous that now, you know, people probably don't need to say it. But you f- you feel what they're feeling exactly, yeah. Yeah. and it, it's clever how you said that point as well. You know the media. If it's a Muslim, the media will play it. It's terrorism. This is what it is. He was radically indoctrinated, etc. Straight away, yeah. without any questions, etc. If someone who's non-Muslim does it, they'll look at every other angle first. Did he have any health problems? Yeah. Was he mentally ill? Yeah. What was going on in his life at the end of the day? Until they've eradicated all those points first. Then they'll have to begrudgingly exactly. say, it's like, say, like, yeah, it was terrorism. Because that's what they have to do. What happened with the, the guy in Norway? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was his name again? Anders, Anders Brevik. Brevik. Yeah. He was in court saying, look, I'm sane. Mm. They were trying to make him insane. Yeah. Right? He was saying, listen, because he knew yeah. if, he, if they said, if they proved that he was insane, mm. Then his political The reason why he did it for yeah, yeah, It goes out the window yeah, that's right. yeah. He was to say Look I, I consciously yeah, yeah, yeah. I killed these people yeah, Because yeah. I've got a particular Political message yeah. And yeah. I have to give that yeah. They were trying to say This guy's insane yeah. Right yeah. Yeah. Okay so moving on Makes sense now Isn't it That whenever these attacks Take place That these people Are also killed At the same time Right Normally yes yes. Yes, yeah. yes So yes. instead of getting them in court and them I mean, the, I mean the, uh, Going back to I mean whether it, we, I think we can say It was Usman Han right yeah. mm-hmm. And certainly from my point of view Someone who's going to do This type of thing He can't be right I- no. In the head He's going to have yeah, to have yeah, Some yeah. problems right yeah. Anyway So mm-hmm. just say this happened And in one way To be honest with you How different is this From someone to Someone to walk into a, a cinema With a gun And kill people Okay anyway yeah. But <laughs> the thing is Is that when he was lying On the floor 
the reality is, is okay, yeah, someone could argue they thought he had a suicide vest on, right? Yeah. And they shot him. But, you know, you most, I would say 10 out of 10 times, most of these guys mm. are normally killed, right? Yeah. But anyway, moving on. Now, there's a certain part of Islam where it's been hijacked by those. And this is not something now, this is something which actually has been, has happened over the, from the missionary times. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time when uh, you had the Orientalists, when they were trying to put the show Muslims were uh, yeah. bloodthirsty or whatever, well, how did how did how they did this was through jihad, okay? So that's why we see jihadi John, and we see you know yeah. this guy Usman was a jihadi. He was linked to a international jihadi network, mm. okay? So what we're seeing is that there are some there's a certain aspect of Islam yeah. which they use. To try to back up their claims, and and we also see Muslims now try to then uh, change or try to rewrite this concept of Islam of jihad in order to uh, to show that listen, no, you're getting it wrong. Jihad mm. isn't about fighting; it's about this and it's about that. Mm. Rather than actually understanding what jihad is and and and, and being confident enough to uh, portray it and yeah. defend it, mm. we see that people. Make excuses for it, right? Yeah. So this is, I think, the next thing which we need to speak about about yeah. the issue of jihad. Yeah, no, I, and it's really linked to terrorism as well. And so one, one quick, go you on. like a disclaimer. Normally, people say J word, and this is just another, another, another <laughs> J word. You yeah. JK? <laughs> no, not JK. But you know, some people you get that like yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. they're scared to say jihad. Yeah. They're so scared of saying it. That the, of it. the word, they'll say J word, right? That's because um, it's been so deliberately been hijacked. Yeah. That's it's the point. Been hijacked one thing, and the secondly, yeah. uh, you mentioned these people. Islam isn't the ideology. They've made jihad the ideology. They're That's calling, right. They're calling, they're calling jihad the ideology. That's right. When no one in history or no Muslim actually claims that and says jihad is an ideology. But the Western media and people who believe this have forced this down the throats and the minds of not only Muslims, but obviously the West will accept it, but down the minds of Muslims to think that this is an ideology. But it's not. Yeah. It's just one element of a hundred and a thousand different elements within Islam but e- that needs to be discussed. But even then it's misrepresented. But what I, what I want to throw this disclaimer out for everyone listening and, and for everyone watching yeah. is that don't get worried. <laughs> We're going to explain <laughs> yeah. jihad in the light of the Quran and the Sunnah. Yeah. Um, and inshallah ta'ala, at the end of this podcast, you'll have a better understanding. Yeah, Inshallah, inshallah yeah. Go no, I was just saying that it's, it is linked to uh, this term terrorism as well. That when when um, a terrorist attack happens or there's something going on, even in the Muslim lands under Daesh and other groups, right? Um, what they've done is they've dragged jihad into the mud with all this all this other package that, that comes along with all this terrorism as as they define it. So, for example, as you were saying, jihadi John, uh, jihadists, the jihadi militia. It's it's used a lot by the West, and this is deliberate, right? And I was doing a bit of research and um, to some of the U.S. policy uh, during the war on terror, in the early days, and even now, right? And there's an institution called uh, the Rand Corporation, and the Rand Corporation is basically a policy think tank who advises the U.S. government on their policy, their foreign policy, more uh, if it's more, more to be more specific, and. They have a report uh, that they wrote in 2005 called The Civil D- Democratic Islam, right? And they wrote this for the US government. And the US government took this on, the Bush, the Bush administration took this on, right? And what they did is they clearly categorized um, different types of Muslim people, right? They categorized each Muslim, where they fit, and how they would define jihad, right? And it's, subhanAllah, it's amazing. They have literally wrote it out, right? And I'll just give you, they, they've got seven groups. I went... I won't mention all of them, uh, but I'll give you a, a few, three of them, right? So they had on the far, like the left, right? They had the radical fundamentalists, right? And the way they said they defined jihad uh, is that there are different levels of jihad, but armed struggle for the establishment of a universal and worldwide Islamic order is incumbent upon anyone physically capable of participating. This can take the form of classical warfare or the terrorism and in- insurgency, right? So that was like the the radical of the radical. This is like the jihadi groups, right? And then they've got other groups, but another one they've got is the the conservative traditionalists, right? Uh, jihad is primarily a struggle for personal moral betterment, uh, but it encompasses war on behalf of Islam when necessary and appropriate. So have you noticed how it gets less extreme, right? Okay. And then all the way to the to the far far I don't want to say far right but far the far left, far far left, left you could left, call it uh, they've got um, radical secularists right <laughs> uh, fighting wars on the grounds of religion and religious differences is completely 
archaic and wrong. So it's, jihad has nothing to do with fighting, okay. right? I'm not saying any of these definitely. We will define the term, right? But I'm not saying any of these are right. But it's very interesting how the West they themselves knew that there are certain Muslims mm. that define jihad different ways, okay. and they how to categorize categorized them, yeah. people, right? Yeah. So if you now define jihad in a way, some of these groups you fall in this group, right? So if you now say it's war and it's to do with battle and it's to do with qital and, you know, how we have it in the history of Islam, mm-hmm. you're now in the bracket of radical fundamentalist, right? Okay. So very interesting. So this is this is how this is linked to terrorism and how they've kind of taken jihad through through the mud. That's fine. So I think let's start discussing then what is jihad mm-hmm. in the light of the Quran and the Sunnah, uh, you know, because yeah. uh, this is something which, like you said, you gave all those categories and unfortunately... Those the, whichever country you fall in, a lot of people will be promoting their own type of view, right? Yeah. So let's discuss what is the actual, you know, the the true the concept definition. of jihad in Islam. I mean, with with Islam, one thing to know and one principle in Islam is that you have uh, a sharia meaning, a sharia meaning, right, for certain words, certain concepts in Islam, uh, along with the literal meaning, right. So to give you a bit of an example before going to the jihad, um, the linguistic meaning of salah, for example, is to supplicate. To yeah. do dua, right? Yeah. But the sharia meaning is to pray, to pray to Allah, to do your five daily prayers, right? So in Islam, the, the principle here is that although there's a literal meaning, we in Islam have redefined that term and we only take the sharia meaning, right? So if I said to you now, brothers, it's time for Maghrib, let's go pray salah. Are you going to turn around and say, are you making dua? You're not, are you? You're going to know that the context, gonna, that yeah, the context of what I'm talking about, I'm going to perform the, the prayer, right? The, the prayer to Allah. Same with kafir, yeah? This is interesting, all right? So kafir linguistically means to cover, yeah, right? Yeah. But in the sharia context, it means a disbeliever. Yeah. So if I now call someone a kafir, you're not going to be like covering him up, covering or <laughs> wearing hijab or, you know, you're going to know that I mean he's a disbeliever, right? So the sharia meaning has always taken precedent over the linguistic Linguist. meaning. So on to jihad. Jihad has a root meaning, Linguist, linguistically it comes from the word juhd, which means to struggle, yeah, mm-hmm. to struggle and strive, right? So we don't deny this, mm-hmm. this is a linguistic sense, jihad does mean to struggle and to strive and to place utmost effort in doing something. However, in the Sharia context, it means to fight in the, in the cause of Allah to make the deen of Allah prevail, right? So it's absolutely linked to the fighting, to, 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 to make war, mm-hmm. um, and anything linked to it. So um, if you're funding uh, the, the noble noble cause of jihad, I'm not talking about militias, I'm talking about the Islamic concept of mm-hmm. jihad in the, the, the way Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam practiced it, right? And the Sahab afterwards, right? Um, to, to fund, to um, even speak and, and encourage Muslims to go, this is part of jihad, right? Um, so this is the real Sharia context. And um, I don't know if there's more to add, but there's some more we can go into uh, the fiqh and the, how the, some of the certain schools of thought how they defined. I mean, the, the way you the way you dis, uh, defined it there that you know fighting uh, in the way of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to make Allah's deen the highest. Obviously, this definition itself is something which is very which is loaded, and we'll need to explain. Yeah. Definitely, you know what does it mean by the fighting? What type of fighting? You know what does it mean by making Allah's deen highest? But one one thing I can say <coughs> is that the the definition of jihad is the same definition you'll find in the four uh, main madhabs, yeah. the four schools of thought, <clears throat> yeah. the Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, and Hanbali. Yeah. In these schools of thought, what you'll find yeah. is that the, uh, the, the, the actual definition of jihad is something which was fully understood at that time and was, stood for, mm-hmm. was understood for centuries. Mm-hmm. And this is something which is not open to any type of discussion because not just because they said it, they derived this definition from the clear-cut ayats of the Quran and from the hadiths. So, so you know, if people are trying to reinterpret what jihad is, yeah. then not are they just going against the classical schools of thought, but they're also clearly going against the clear evidences in the Quran and the Sunnah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, every ideology has uh, 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 an intellectual uh, defense mechanism in place, and it also has a uh, physical defense mechanism in place, uh, and also uh, a method of propagation. It will. They all have this. It's uh, universal within them. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, I've, I've learned as well is this word jihad, <coughs> it's not a pre-Islamic word. It didn't exist pre-Islam. So... Anyone to try and claim and say it's, it's, the word has nothing to do with Islam is specifically linked to Islam. 
<laughs> and what was going on in Islam at the time. Mm. So, um, again, I think there's some good points that you've made there that look, you know, jihad has a specific meaning and it's been hijacked by the West and the deliberate link of that to terrorism is for a specific agenda. Mm. And it takes uh, a Muslim and th- I encourage you know all the brothers and sisters who watch this, who listen to this, that they need to look at the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, you can't uh, you know, no, no, we can't even make that statement and say, "Look, we're going to talk about jihad" without somebody saying, "Well, who's the reference point for this?" Yeah. So the reference point is Rasulullah Sallam, and if well, what are you saying then? So the Rasulullah Sallam didn't partake in in jihad. Okay, so when was jihad used? I mean, what 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 is the role of jihad? So one thing we've already established yeah. is jihad is to do with fighting, yeah, mm-hmm. but not just fighting, like you said, J.K. Anything that. Supports this cause, whether yeah. it's uh, through yeah. the through motivating yeah. through the through the tongue, mm. or whether it's through through financial uh, support, right? Yeah. But uh, you know, what are what is jihad? When was jihad used? And then we can discuss yeah. what are the conditions. Why yeah. is it that yeah. people cannot, uh, you know, start killing people left, right, and center right. themselves and call themselves yeah, 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 yeah. call it jihad, That's killing right. innocent yeah, yeah. people and stuff yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. So let's go into this. Yeah. So jihad itself. I know, I know you, you. I thought you you went you went on that route, mm. but then you like you just did a U turn mm. in the sense like you're speaking about that Islam as a, a methodology of how yeah, yeah. to uh, preserve and how to to uh, implement how to propagate Correct. the deen. So so I wanted to elaborate on that is that what is the purpose of of Islam? What is the purpose? The purpose is to liberate mankind. Mm. So to liberate mankind. So so when you mentioned about jihad fighting fighting jihad isn't to fight. Jihad is not to fight, to say that that's the objective, to fight. The objective is not to fight. The objective is to liberate man and to remove any obstacles that are in the way in order to further propagate and speed up this process. And if, if, if whatever obstacles in the way, whatever comes in the way, whether it's someone was to build, I don't know, a massive wall that we couldn't scale, etc. To remove that is a physical obstacle mm-hmm. in order for us to carry Islam to the rest of mankind to liberate them from the shackles of, of darkness. Yeah. So when people turn around and say jihad is to fight, to kill or anything like that, that's not the objective. It's not to kill kill people or yeah. to, you know, it is to remove these physical obstacles that are in the place in order to propagate the beauty of Islam to the rest of mankind. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because on one hand, you have the West um, using these. So they, they understand that Islam or jihad has some sort of physical nature to it. Like you said, and that's not the objective. Mm. That's not the objective at all. The objective is to liberate mankind. But they use this side of it to term the words such as jihadi and jihadism right uh, but and then there's, on, the, on the other hand you have and i think it's probably died down slightly but um where there's been certain movements or scholars you could call it where they've tried to define jihad in the pure linguistic sense so it's all about struggle mm. against one's nafs even waking up for fajr is, is jihad for yeah. example and you know giving charity is jihad and and actually we know from the Messenger of and from the Quran, this is not the case. So the Messenger of said, uh, perform jihad against the disbelievers with your wealth, your hands and your tongues. And as, as we've said, so it is, can be physical, but actually also with your wealth and, mm. and with your, 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 your tongue. Sure. So speaking out against it. But I think the, the main point, like you were saying, what is the objective? So what's the objective of jihad? What, what are we trying to achieve? And first thing is a collective objective, right? It's a fard kifaya. Mm. So it's not an individual thing that I can go to the Muslim lands and just take on myself and, 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 and perform jihad, right? It's a collective duty. It's something that, uh, in the natural sense, if the Islam, we have the Islamic system, the Khalif organizes the army, organizes the military, and takes this, uh, you know, takes Islam to wider lands to liberate them, to, to bring Islam to them, to remove the physical barriers for people to see the justice of Islam and to see the truth of Islam. So mm-hmm. this is the objective, to, to make the deen of Allah prevail. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَتَكُونُوا فِتْنَةٌ وَيَكُونُوا الدِّينُ كُلُّهِ إِلَّهِ And fight them until persecution is no more and the deen is all for Allah. Right, and I looked into the tafsir of this ayah. Ah, what does it mean? What did the, what did the mufassirin say about this? And uh, one of the tafsir said that I think it was tafsir maududi. Uh, this aim and objective of jihad has two aspects: the negative and the positive. On the negative side, the aim of jihad is to abolish fitna, and on the positive, it is to establish Allah's way completely and its entirety. This is the only objective for which it is lawful, nay, obligatory, for the believers to fight. 
there is no object for which fighting is lawful and it does not behoove the believers to resort to fighting for any other objective. So it's very clear. Mm -hmm. It is enough. for the deen of Allah to prevail. It's not for the fighting for the sake yeah. of it. It's not for aiding the Western genders. None of that. It's purely mm -hmm. for the deen of Allah to prevail. So the way I see it is, if you think of it in this way, right? That Islam, we know Islam is the haq, is the truth, undeniable truth, right? And we see that the Messenger Wasallam brought this truth and we see that the methodology of spreading this to the, the rest of mankind is via jihad, okay? Mm -hmm. But like Shaz said, I mean, Shaz made the, the, the valid point about that. It's not just about fighting. So we see that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent, when he, when he sent uh, the letters to the uh, you know, foreign yeah. dignitaries and the kings and so on, mm -hmm. there were three conditions. Yeah. The first one was to accept Islam. The second one is if you don't want to accept Islam yourself as an individual, mm -hmm. that's fine because la ikra fi deen. There's no yeah. compulsion in the deen, Correct. right? Correct. But you have to come under the the authority of uh, of uh, Islam, and yeah, we will you know take over the land. You pop, become part of the the Islamic State, mm -hmm. um, and you pay the jizya. Yeah. Okay. And the third option is if they if they refused, the third option was to fight them. Mm -hmm. Now. Couple of things I want to mention on this one. You know the first option. You know when the when the when the the messenger went, and most of these times not the messenger sallallahu but the messenger who's carrying the message, right? Most of the time these were sahaba. So when these sahaba went to these foreign dignitaries, what they would have done, they would not have just given a postcard saying accept Islam. Yeah. What they would have done, they would have discussed and given the Islamic proofs of why this is the haq. Mm, yeah. Now, once he presented that, if the guy accepts it, alhamdulillah. If he doesn't accept it, okay, after you've shown, mm -hmm. then you say, fine, you don't need to become a Muslim, but mm -hmm. I've shown you the clear truth now, mm -hmm. and you cannot become an obstacle to your people mm -hmm. to see the true justice, because you want, you know, if it might be your personal choice not to Correct. accept Islam, yeah. but you are an obstacle yeah. to your people. That's mm -hmm. right. And only after that stage, where after he knows the truth, mm -hmm. and after he then uh, rejects this second uh, condition, then yeah. uh, the armies of jihad, you know, are set upon the uh, uh, the armies of of the enemy. Mm -hmm. But remember one thing: it's not the civilians. Yeah. Yeah. They're just fighting the obstacle because yeah. if these armies, if they once they surrender. Then obviously there's the conditions and stuff like that. Yeah. But then that fighting stops. Yes, right. right? So what we yeah. see from here is that when people say jihad and they link it to terrorism and stuff like that, I will say that the jihad, the armies of jihad were the armies of mercy. Of course, because Allah. here you had people willing to sacrifice the most dearest thing to them, which is their life, yeah. to take the truth yeah. to other people. To liberate them. And to liberate to, them. To free them. And, it, and you touched on it. It's their right. So if a leader is stopping his people having the right of justice of Islam to be uh, helping them and imp being imposed on them, then they are an obstacle. They and the people who are supporting him or the people who are maybe an army, it might not be an army, it might be something, somebody completely different, but there's still a physical barrier allowing Muslims and Islam to be able to help uh, the rest of us. Yeah, definitely. And, and and that's the interesting point, isn't it? That with jihad, it was a mercy. It wasn't, you know, with all this negative connotation surrounding this word. And the reality and the fact is that jihad was a mercy to mankind. And the Messenger was a mercy to mankind. So, so, so you'll find in the hadith and in many of the examples that we find, um, the, the rules, the strict rules of jihad, right? Mm -hmm. So in a hadith, the Messenger explained 10 rules of jihad. So when the armies would go out, as you said, they'd present the message. That these three steps would take place, right? But if they had to go to war mm. against the other enemy's army, like the the fire, the you know the, the, the last fire, resort, the last resort, there were these ten rules, and the ten rules were: the Messenger of Allah said, "Do not kill any child, any woman, or." elderly or sick person do not practice treachery or mutilation of the bodies do not uproot or burn the palms or cut down fruitful trees do not slaughter the sheep the cow and the, the you know the, the camels except if you to, to eat it if one fights his brother he must avoid striking the face for god created him with the image of adam uh, do not kill the monks or the monastery do not destroy the monasteries or the places of worship do not destroy the villages or the towns or the cultivated fields and do not um, do not wish for an encounter with the enemy. 
uh, pray to God to grant you security, but when you are forced to encounter them, exercise patience. Meaning, you shouldn't be wishing to go and kill the, the enemies. Yeah. Actually, if you can, uh, you know, just deal with the problem and, and, and you know, they're forced to pay jihad, and so jizya, um, then, you know, we should take that route. And these are all the rules. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. All of those, yeah? All of the, the, yeah, the 10 rules. So much for the Geneva Convention. You know? when, yeah. when we've got Islam, you don't need the Geneva 1400 years ago. Subhanallah. Exactly. And the Subhanallah. Be- beautiful thing is, I mean, without getting into too much examples, but the first one that comes to my mind is the uh, Salah al Al Ayyubi, Rahimahullah, when he, you know, conquered, uh, uh, liberated, shall I say, yeah. uh, Al Quds in Jerusalem and, and, and how he, you know, how he treated the people. Yeah. But okay, so you know, Subhanallah, with the stuff that you're coming out with, I'll be honest with you, I'm thinking that. Uh, we should actually do a podcast yeah, a just lot, for a lot jihad there, you know, itself because you know it's uh, yeah. there, there's a lot there. So in the future, maybe inshallah ta'ala we will do something on jihad uh, and maybe bring in some of the misconceptions, not from the non-Muslims, yeah. but actually from the Muslims that are being promoted that they're promoting yeah. about jihad as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, but one thing I can say is that from what you guys have spoken about is you've you've shown there that jihad a is an integral part of Islam. Mm. Okay. And B is something which um, cannot be linked to terrorism in any way, shape, or form, because this is something which has checks. <clears throat> is something which, if performed in the correct way, mm. uh, is a mercy, mm. um, and not something which is used, you know, to terrorize people, mm. and is not something which is used to just conquer lands like the colonials may have done in the past, which will which will come to inshallah. Yeah. Mm. So what okay, so moving on. So the you know, we said at the beginning, the discussion the the brother wanted to do the topic is who are the real terrorists? <laughs> so I'm asking you guys, guys, who are the real terrorists? SubhanAllah. And this is the crux of the ma- of the matter, right? So we we've explained how Islam and jihad isn't about terror and causing terror and terrorism. But um the thing we need to really highlight is who are those who are causing terror and subhanallah i've done a bit of research and it's amazing yeah. it's it's eye-watering it's eye-watering the amount of terror uh, the, the 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 west yeah. and secular uh, secular states have caused right uh, the state the, level yeah uh, state level right? i like to call it sst and slt that's not diseases by the way <laughs> that's it's std that, that's uh, <laughs> s state sponsored terrorism and state level terrorism yeah so yeah, and I think re- that's the that's the real terrorism, and we can go into that. Definitely, into definitely. It. I mean, it's reported almost ninety million have been killed as a result of secular state terrorism. Ninety million. Ninety million, right? And this isn't the previous, like when the the, the Native Americans. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about modern day secularism. How many they've killed, right? What, in the last uh, century and a half. In the last probably? century and a half, for example, okay. right? Subhan- to give examples, right? The Iraq War, something close, quite close in our lifetime, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, One point two million at a minimum, because these are reported. They don't. Report yeah, 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 this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right yeah, yeah. at a minimum, mm. the reported one point two million Muslims uh, were killed due to the U.S. But I think invasion. that ninety million you're saying, because it's a big number. I think that might be uh, people that have died um, directly and indirectly. Because of secular wars, yeah, yeah, yeah. correct? Could, yeah. Um, or is that ninety million people that are being killed? I mean, no, it's not just killed, even indirectly. So in, afterwards, even yeah, yeah, afterwards, yeah, yeah. Like, like of because of the wars, because of the wars. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it might not be directly that. That's they what I think is a massive number. It's a, it's a massive number, but I would argue it's, it's even more. Really. Yeah, I don't, like I said, these these figures seem like they're they're, they're conservative figures. They're right, right, so right. Yeah. Okay. Because if you think about it, when they're doing this killing, they're not reporting. They're not bothered about reporting, yeah, yeah. right? The Muslim village is cheap to them, right? So, like I said, in Iraq, one point two million. This is going to be a massive underestimate right and it's not just killing you know it's easy to talk about the numbers of killed but the torture in Abu Ghraib for example mm. that, think of the CIA torture reports that were released these are what they found imagine the amount of torture that happened to Muslim and look, and look and at one of the rules that you mentioned already about mutilating exactly. bodies and, and torturing and torturing etc it's, so not, it's not allowed for us it's not allowed for Muslims or state level to be able to even do that, to even conceive yeah. that. But for them, they don't follow these rules. Yeah. They might have the G- uh, Geneva Conventions. They, they, they don't follow them. this, right? So in Afghanistan, for example, you had at least 500,000 reported to have been killed mm-hmm. as a result of the invasion of Afghanistan. And even continues today. That's less, bro. That, that's what I thought. Well, I looked at the numbers, but okay. like, how can you, who can you trust, really? Exactly, okay. yeah. That's, that, you know, and, and, and you know how you mentioned about, uh, it only came out recently, yeah. Uh, in Iraq now, the new babies that are being born yeah. with the depleted uranium that is mm-hmm. being, and that's yeah. the effect. And this is the this is the effect that Western colonial powers and state level terrorism 
state-sponsored terrorism has across the globe, that the ramifications and the after effects they yeah. last for centuries. Yeah. They don't True. last for ten days, a year, five years. You know, they last for centuries. So that has to be linked to the the actual initial uh, uh, attack. The in- yeah. initial attack. So yeah. when we say about oh, you're affecting a population. It's not just for that generation. You're talking about generation after generation after generation. Exactly. At the end of the yeah. day. So take, for example, in Iraq, the Fallujah. What happened in Fallujah? They used white phosphorus, yeah. right? And now there's reports of babies, deformed babies, uh, cancer. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's lots of these Bro, reports. the Fallujah, I remember one stage years ago, because obviously this happened a, a while back, and I remember somebody was telling me that some of the uh, imams or the doctors, might, might have been doctors in the, in the Fallujah, they were actually encouraging people and, and women to say, look, not to not to give birth to babies because they were, all, they were all like, most of them were yeah. deformed and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's sad, it's really sad yeah. because it's a long-term effect. So not have, not only have they killed, they've actually caused long-term effects that are going to last for mm-hmm. centuries, like you said. Um, and just to link to that, who, who are the nation to have used the nuclear bomb? bomb. Yeah. The only nation. Yeah. The US, the two US. times, yep. in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Yeah. And they killed thousands and millions in doing this, but also the same things, long-term after effects of uh, cancer, of mm. um, you know, birth defects, and still being reported today. The thing is, bro, is you, you're, you're giving some examples there. Of, of, And what makes it worse is the fact that it's not just that these are not, not just the people you're talking about, is you're talking about the people who are actually accusing the Muslims and accusing Islam um, of yeah, being barbaric. barbaric. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, uh, Surah Baqarah, verse 11, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that and when it is said to them, do not cause corruption on the earth, they say we are but the peacekeepers. Subhanallah. And subhanAllah, you know, if you think about even in history, I mean, you give me some current examples. Yeah. In history, you know, uh, whether w- what the Crusaders did in, uh, in uh, Al-Quds. SubhanAllah. Yeah. Um, what we saw with the native Indians yeah. Subhanallah what King Leopold II did in the Congo right 10 million people they say he killed so 10 yeah, million more than Hitler and the, the Native yeah. Americans is reported 130 million Native Americans were killed yeah. by the, the, the Europeans I mean the Americans today yeah. 130 million were wiped off the land yeah. these Native million, Subhanallah man. and Subhanallah. The, 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 the South Americans exactly yeah. Yeah. you know and even yeah. for example in uh, and somebody should check this uh, yeah. For example, when France went to uh, liberate the people in Libya, okay, yeah. from Gaddafi, but Subhanallah in Algeria, um, what France did to the Muslims in 132 years of colonial rule. And remember, when when the French had taken over Algeria, they annexed Algeria in a way where they said this is part of France now. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. It wasn't even like oh, this is just a colony. Mm. This was part of France, and Subhanallah. They say that in 1945, just in 1945, 45,000 Algerians were killed over a few days. Yeah, because these people, they were calling for independence. Yeah. And, um, and I would, like you said, and, and subhanAllah, what, what it seems like we're doing here is, you know, we're, we're competing in better <laughs> examples <laughs> yeah, of you're the saying atrocities that one. committed by of these Of course, people. look at what happened in, like you said, in, in the Bengal famine. Look at what happened there. Four million, it was reported, were killed. At left, denying people human beings and they were obviously all Muslim food that's 4 million and it was deliberate systemic in order do you those people off and do, do you know what example we haven't mentioned yeah. that's probably the most prominent example in every Muslim's mind Palestine yeah how many thousands of millions have been killed in Palestine and they continually be per- persecuted today as well subhanallah I mean the list goes on like it's, it's like endless list and subhanallah the fact that their own birth was based on terror and terrorism it really does highlight who the real terrorists are and who, who and are the real the, the thing is is like i said to you what makes it worse is here now now, now you have people who are promoting this i mean you mentioned the famine thing mm. well how many muslims know about sultan abdul majid the second um who sent uh, money and, and ships full of food to ireland the mm. irish potato to, famine. To, to Ar- the irish, the irish potato, potato famine, famine yeah. right and okay. up until today, in I think I can't remember the port's name. I think it starts with a D, but I'm not going to mention yeah. it, right? Yeah. But in that port now, even that football team of that that place where that port was, yeah. you know, their their emblem, I think it's still like the yeah, uh, yeah. crescent and the and the star, the and they have like you know a a plaque, uh, you know, uh, as a memorial and and re- to remember mm. 
what the what the Ottomans did. You mm. know, the Ottomans did that. The right? Ottomans. You just you just mentioned <laughs> Palestine there. You mentioned Palestine. Yeah. Mm. You know, no mentions about Sultan Bayezid, yeah. who when he sent the ships to rescue the Jews yeah. from uh, the Spanish, Spanish Inquisition yeah. in Spain, and then brought them back right. to yeah. the Ottoman the the Muslim lands. So what we what we what we uh, seeing here. Is Subhanallah a difference of night and day? Yeah. yeah. So basically, you what you're saying is you're seeing the Islamic history is littered with the true peacemakers and not the fake UN peacemakers who sit by and watch yeah. the genocide that took place in like Srebrenica and Bosnia. Subhanallah, yeah? Srebrenica. Yeah. 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 Subhanallah. Bro, there's too many. Too many. Too many. That's what I'm saying. What happened in Chechnya? Yeah. Mm. You know, Allah, Allah, literally Allah, the Akbar, list, list so These up. genocides have been recorded and, and filmed. And shown mm. to Muslims, and this is genocide. And this what you're show, what you're showing there is the history yeah. of Islam. But okay, I'm gonna throw in uh, uh, throw in something to what do they call it a curveball. Curveball, curveball, yeah. curve yeah. right? Baseball, isn't it, bro? <laughs> curveball, baseball. Baseball. Yeah, baseball. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, whatever. Not cricket. It's not cricket, bro. If it was, then it'd be a yoker, innit? <laughs> but, so if I'm throwing a yoker now, you're on about. We're on about, You just mentioned genocide and stuff yeah. there. Now, from what I've seen, is that the only thing that has been used against Islam and Muslims. Um, is to do with the Armenian genocide, which we know only recently, <laughs> a couple of months ago, if it's been that long. Yeah. Yeah. The Americans, uh, uh, you know, the, recognized, they recognized yeah. uh, that the Turks, the Ottomans, actually committed the Armenian genocide. Okay, so if someone turns around and says, "Well, look, you're trying to say your history is so clean," what happened in the Armenian genocide? So, I mean, this took place in 1915. Uh, during the latter parts of the Ottoman state or the Hilafat. Um But it is one of the biggest lies ever to come out of that Bro, era. that's a big, big one, you know, big uh, claim. We've got some big statements to back it up as well, inshallah. Okay, okay. So, sure. uh, I mean, again, like I said, it took place during that, that period of time. And what was going on is that if you look at the uh, colonial powers... They were pretty much diminished the strength of the uh, the Muslims by the Young Turk movement. The Ottomans, you mean? The yeah. Ottomans, sorry, yeah, yeah. So they had uh, pretty much diminished uh, what the Ottoman state was, and the Young Turks were were taking over from that perspective. Mm. But I really want to tackle this from the point of view that um, if you have treachery taking place uh, in any state, there is a mechanism in place to deal with that. Um, so from a state level point of view If you're having internal treachery um, Then how would you deal with that? You would obviously deal with it For like for like So if the treachery is taking place From a media propaganda point of view You would counteract it with that narrative If the treachery is taking place From a physical uprising You would then quash this uprising That okay. is taking place mm. So what happened? So the Armenians uh, were being used uh, and they were the uh, inroads into the Islamic State of trying to destroy it furthermore because what they'd actually seen is in the Balkans at the time obviously the Muslims were losing power and losing land uh, space within there so they'd seen all the other countries taking uh, sovereignty away uh, they were taking their own rule so the Armenians now wanted their own specific uh, uh, backing or wanted their own um, uh, uh, independent statelet and the French promised them this mm. that you cause these problems you cause X, Y and Z problems for the Muslims and we will then promise you this uh, this state with the borders that you are actually saying so that was actually you know noted down historically that the, this meeting took place yeah. uh, with a, a certain uh, Armenian militia movement and what the French wanted was a certain number of uh, physical entity or soldiers, if you want to call them, to be able to cause this because they realize the, the Muslims are weak now, the Ottoman state is weakness. So how do we now counteract it? So this actually took place uh, uh, ju during that, that period of time in 1915. So this thing about genocide was mm. something that was concocted afterwards. Yeah. Now, let me paint a, a picture. Imagine you're a state, you're weak, you're down on its knees, you're, you're, you're wiped out now. Okay, and the colonial powers are in charge of you. They can say what they want, do what they want to you. Yeah. You got you got no leg to stand on. Yeah. Correct? Would you agree H with that? History is written by the victors. Yeah, yeah. and you would agree with that. That yeah. if when when you're weak and down on your knees, mm. 
you're going to be subservient to whoever's in charge of you, right? Mm-hmm. And whatever they're going to say and however they want to write history, they can. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, what you've said is, is is bang on in the sense that. But you haven't explained what. Yeah, happened. that's so, what I was, so, was just going to join okay, you there. Sorry, yeah? you just, so, 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 what actually took place is then, um, the Armenians claimed this genocide after the destruction of the Islamic State. That this took place. What took place though? Because like, so, something did happen though, yeah, bro. Histori- okay. Historically, something did happen. That's right. And I said it was that this treachery took place. There were soldiers. These soldiers were funded. Fueled, weaponized by the colonialist powers. Yeah. So there's no difference to what when America was funding the Taliban or jihadis or Muslims and popularized this word to fight against the Soviets, a war by proxy they called it. So there's no difference with the colonials weaponizing the uh, Armenians that were living under the Islamic State, living in the uh, the Ottoman state at the time. Uh, and there was no difference there but what they asked them for is to create this fitna to fight to go and destroy people and I will further touch on this point of the proof of this which came out from their own mouths which came out from the Armenians own mouths at the end of the day mm-hmm. so in, 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 in after uh, the destruction of the Islamic State a trial was held a trial was held where 130 senior members high ranking levels from the uh, the Ottoman Khilafah were taken from so you're taken from your own land so you haven't even got the security of saying you're being in your own land were taken to Malta which belonged obviously to the colonials now and a trial was held there so imagine this trial now you're you're being subjugated to all these claims even the British couldn't find evidence to back the claims of the Armenians. Mm. And that's noted down in history. Oh, so in that time period, when you're at your weakest, you've got no one to protect you, there's no army, there's no khalif. Even then, the British, the colonials who were fighting against you, couldn't back up the yeah, the, the point the Armenians were making. Okay, That's one point. I mean, the like you said, it was, it was in the midst of World War One. So mm. 1915, obviously, is in World War I, the time, and, the, and the Ottomans entered the war in, on, in 1914, right? So actually, they joined the Allied powers, right? And as you're saying, the Armenians actually were treacherous and they joined the Central powers. Yeah. So now you've got within your... Because this is the Ottoman state, right? Mm. So if you've got a population in your state that have joined the enemy from, from the, from the mm. uh, context of World War I, obviously, that's going to, re- it's going to lead to consequences, right? And as I think the key point to mention as well... The Muslims didn't have the power then. Who who was in charge? It was the Young Turks. The Young mm. Turks had already, in 1908, taken p- charge. And the Khalif was merely a, a title. Right? It was the Young Turks who, due to their Turkish nationalism and due to their, um, you know, the fact that they were pushed to push uh, Tur- t- the Turk, the Turk, um, Turkish state, they didn't want the Armenians. So, yes, something happened. I w- let's not deny that it did happen. But it's been exaggerated, and actually, it's not the Muslims that have caused it. And I think the the other key point is that imagine in our fourteen hundred year history, the one example they use is at the end of our history mm-hmm. when we didn't have the mm. power. Yeah. They use this. So if there had been examples of this in history of Islam, they would have used it. Obviously, they would have used it. But the reality is that they're few and far between, and they use the Armenian genocide as their get out clause to to, to target. Do, do you know? Do you know who who Anis Chaznunis is? Yeah, yeah, local butcher. <laughs> He's not a footballer, man. Okay, all right. Basically, he was the first prime minister of an independent Armenia. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. I just want to read something that he submitted a report when he was making these uh, uh, two. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah. It was, but it was written. A report was written. I just want to read something, uh, an excerpt from there. Are we not capable of doing what we did in Turkish Armenia? What we did in, uh, t- uh, so, uh, sorry, are, no, are we not capable of doing what we did? in uh, uh, Russian Armenia, what we did in Turkish Armenia for 10 years, we certainly are. And the report further highlights the attacks that they took place, uh, the, the, the militia movements that they created, etc. So he is actually admitting, yeah. look, we did this, we did this in a covert operation, mm. and as the West like to call covert operation, they did this in covert operations, and they did yeah. this as well. So th- let's, not, let's not hide behind the fact that they were traitors, they were living in, uh, in in the Islamic State, they were the traitors. So obviously, when when treachery takes place, it needs to be quashed. Yeah, yeah I think um, I think what you've 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 
back to up there. I mean, my, my take was slightly different because yeah. from what I've, the research I've done in the past, not recently, but ages ago, was to do with the fact that the Armenians were basically allowing the Russians yeah. a passage through to, to Turkey. Exactly. And they were allying with the Russians and, and they were killing Turks and Muslims in, in the area. Mm. So what the Turks did, and again, these weren't the Ottomans, these were mm. the young Turks, they shifted them to Syria because... What they want to do is they want to make that the, the area where they were living, they want to make that a buffer zone between them and Russia. Yeah. Whilst these people were there, in fact, it was similar to, you know, uh, at the Battle of uh, the Trench, mm-hmm. how we had the, the Jewish tribe. Yeah. Had that Jewish tribe allowed the Quraysh to come in from that route, yeah. the Muslims would have been routed in, yeah. in a military point of view, right? That was treachery. Um, right? Yeah. That was treachery, <laughs> right? So what we see is that. Um, but even if someone did use these claims to try to say it was Islam and all that, A, we've established it's not from Islam. B, we've, we also established that even if someone did it, they weren't applying Islam. No. Okay, and people are humans. Yeah. And certainly the, the uh, JK makes a fair point. The fact that in 1400 years of history, you know, they use one example. Yeah. That itself, as Shaz has pointed out, is not clear whatsoever and actually points towards the fact that this never happened in the way that is portrayed. Or all the way it's linked to the Ottoman Khilafah anyway. Exactly. Uh, but anyway, listen. No, no, I just we, want to touch on that point. Because very quick very point, very quick very point. Quickly. Um, in, I think, 2007 or 2005, the Turkish government itself opened up all its archives for the international community. That's true. That's true. For yeah. anyone to look at those archives and say, right, find us the evidences that took place. Because obviously within history, you can find any records, any commands, people uh, uh, m- making military maneuvers against those people. Mm. That never took place. And they're still open to anyone to look at that part. The Dashnak party, which was the main political party, obviously, at the time, I think, within Armenia itself, still withholds its records, yeah, internally. Um, it won't show those records. And also has political records in Boston, America, right? And they are locked. And they still won't open and allow people access to these. Because you know why? It proves the treachery that they actually took place. And okay. they did. Okay, inshallah, subhanAllah. So, I mean, what we can see from that, is the fact that uh, you know, like I said before, the the only thing that they accuse the Muslims is something which, you know, is is unfair, and to try to use, just if you had a scale, right, scales, and, and you put all the atrocities on one side, and you even put the the you know uh, the Armenian issue, uh, which itself seems like you know it never really uh, happened the way it was described, there's no balance. But anyway, let's inshallah start bringing the podcast to a close. As the people who are watching this can see, it's getting dark outside, <laughs> and we will need to be praying Maghrib soon as well. Um, what I will say is that what you guys have highlighted through the podcast is that you know what we can see is that Islam itself, mm. um, jihad, has nothing to do with terrorism. It's a noble concept. Uh, you know the virtues of it. You know, just read the hadith. The best of mankind, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, has, has explained this to us. And actually, what we can see is that this is a tool that's being used yeah. by the West in order to push their agendas in the Muslim lands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually, when we're talking about who are the real terrorists, like Shah said, it's the uh, ST um, something SSP SSP SLT. Right? It's not a sandwich as well. Okay, SL, yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, it's state sponsored terrorism, terrorism, right? You know, we've, and, and subhanAllah, we've got to show there's so many examples. Yeah. So, to bring it to a close, if you look at both sides that we've just explained there, mm-hmm. why is it that Muslims are on the defensive? Mm-hmm. Why is it that we don't uh, counteract these accusations made against Islam? The noble concepts against our beloved messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why is it we are on defensive? Why is it that, in fact, because we are on the defensive, we even start to interpret things yeah. incorrectly? Mm-hmm. Why is that? And I think it's mainly because it's a matter of understanding and knowledge. You know, today, even just in this short time, we've been able to explain the difference between what the Western colonialists did and how many they killed and the terror they caused, compared to jihad and Islam. In the history, right, and the fact that we, it did follow certain rules, and the Messenger of for example, in the conquest of Mecca, applied some of these rules. It, it, that was that occurred with minimal bloodshed, mm. because the, the purpose is not about killing mm. or fighting. The purpose is about liberating mankind and 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 showing the justice of Islam. So, 
you know, what I'd advise our listeners and our Muslims to do is learn, read, understand the seerah, understand what actually occurred in the, the life of the Sahaba as well and the companions afterwards, because in, it shows that the, the true difference between the two. And, you know, the fact that we didn't rape the lands of all its resources, rape the people, destroy that we, all the destruction we see today. We didn't do any of that. And examples they use are very exaggerated, like the Armenian Genocide. Mm. So for me, I think mainly it is about understanding and knowledge and, and really, you know, I'd ask the Muslim to do that. To, SubhanAllah, to just SubhanAllah. some of the things that you just mentioned about, you know, raping and pillaging the mm. lands. And you already mentioned in those 10 points earlier on where you can't destroy, exactly. uh, you know, like crops, wood and trees, yeah. crops, yeah. you know, which were the, the, the financial resources or the, the, the commodities of its time yeah. or, you know, the animals. So you can't, you can't, you can't do that. Islam yeah. doesn't permit you to do that, you know. So it already covers that. And I think it, it, a lot of it is that, is that Muslims, they're, they're given the narrative by the Western institutions and Western thinkers of what their history is. Yeah. And it's incumbent on Muslims to go out and to learn and find out about the actual true history of its deen. Mm-hmm. I think it's no point sitting on the fence and saying, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's our duty to find yeah. out what actually happened in history and not be written by the Orientalists and the Western media to exactly. portray what it is about Islam. But there's a really, really good podcast here. Yeah? It's called Talking Sira. If you tune into that, it covers a lot. I wonder, wonder who presents that. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. That was a good plug in there. <laughs> <laughs> plug in there yeah, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, to be honest with you, just to second the sort of advice that you're giving, I think yeah. what it really does boil down is that it boils down to us really understanding our deen. And I think before any of that, you know what? You have to have is desire. Mm-hmm. You know, if you think about it, we have a desire to study because we want a good job mm. we have a desire to do many things that car we want that house we want we put the effort with that desire nothing will happen so mm. this same desire we should have it anyway but certainly in 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 light of this onslaught that we're witnessing and not mm. just us what you got to understand is that if we don't understand it tomorrow when our children mm. who are going to come across challenges which we never experienced mm. they have some challenging times ahead yes, of them of ahead of them when they come to us and we don't understand it when they give us examples of Banu Quraidah and they give examples of your messenger did this and he killed all these people and yeah. this and that and you know if we can't defend that mm. then how are our kids how are they going to understand yeah. that this is a religion from the 7th century which was barbaric mm. and now because of human rights mm. and freedoms and all of this, it has no place, you know, and that's what it boils down to. So, you know, my advice and, and I think all of our advice really is that as Muslims, we can't complain if, you know, all these accusations are being met and we cannot challenge them. We can't complain if we don't try to find out and dig for the truth ourselves, Correct. right? Okay. And if we, you know, prioritize all the things ahead of this, ahead of defending our deen, Ahead of defending our the reputation and the legacy of our messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then reality is, is if tomorrow our children are not interested in Islam, where they see human rights and they see the Winston Churchill is their role model and their hero, right? Then who have we got to blame? No one but ourselves. Okay. Another point, just to you know, as we bring this to close, what I'll say is that another thing we can see is, you know, we mentioned jihad. What we can see is that the attack on Islam, we see it's an attack on the political aspects of Islam. Mm-hmm. It's the attack on the methodology of Islam. If you were to remove jihad from Islam, then the mechanism, the methodology that's been you know, uh, prescribed for how Muslims carry their deen, mm-hmm. yep. this is absent, this is gone now. Mm-hmm. And that's why even Muslims, when you hear the argument of, well, Indonesia became Muslims without any fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah alhamdulillah, yeah, yeah. that's brilliant, yeah. right? But that's another but, facet, that's another yeah, aspect of That's it, another okay. aspect of yeah. the beauty of Islam. But yeah. no one can, you know, r- r- remove the fact that from history, yeah. the fact that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed jihad, course, exactly. the fact that Islam spread through North Africa and all these places, through Persia, through Sham, via yeah. jihad, via it's great heroes like Khalid ibn Walid, radiallahu yeah. anhu. So, I think you know it's it's a good place. I think to bring this podcast to to a close. Is there any final points that you guys wanna wanna mention? Inshallah, Taala. 
just that uh, yeah you you mentioned some some interesting points and uh, um especially the one about um our children and the future generation um the the narrative from the west is always going to be a negative one it will never ever allow something a different ideology to be portrayed as superior and muslims need to wake up to that fact and need to in, be more investigative and look and there's we don't need to go far we look at rasulullah sallam's life and you apply what the rules of jihad were and that's what they are we're not saying they're any different nothing's changed they're exactly the same rules that existed at that time now cross apply and look at what the western world has done just forget any other time let's just look at the last 100 years forget even that let's just look at the last 30 years and compare that compare that and i challenge anyone find us from the islamic history this level of death and destruction and murder mm. of innocent civilian people which they use this heinous term collateral damage which is disgusting and it's obligatory i think on muslims to look more into what islam actually really is and this specifically this subject matter so so on that note who are the real terrorists the west the west yeah. Inshallah, ta'ala, let's end on that. Really, Jazakallah had for both my special guests, Marakhla, brother JK Jazakallah. and brother Shaz. And SK. JK and SK. JK and SK. <laughs> um, I like this tag team. Okay. I was going to make some more, but yeah, we're running out of time. Right? <laughs> so, Inshallah, ta'ala, we'll end on that note. Jazakallah had for uh, watching or listening to this podcast. Inshallah, ta'ala, please share it with your family and friends and visit all our platforms on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Um, and all popular podcast platforms and inshallah until the next podcast assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu thanks for watching that video for more exclusive videos please like share and subscribe to our channel don't forget you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms and for more voice of the ummah content make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below